So uh, the uh, density of activities between China and the Philippines has been increasing uh, every day. Uh, we have several events going on, uh, Chinese delegations coming to Manila, Philippine delegations going to China. Even as we speak today, on this day, there is a talk uh, at the uh, Confucius Institute of the Ateneo de Manila uh, in uh, Makati City. Uh, a speaker on the uh, One Belt, One Road will be featured. But uh, we're focusing this week uh, on the um, a visit of the China Institute of International Studies uh, and uh, meeting with the Philippine Council for Foreign Affairs uh, hosted by uh, um, uh, retired Ambassador Joe Romero and uh, a very interesting discussion here. And uh, the visitors were uh, Ron uh, Zhong Zhe, PhD, Executive Vice President and Senior Fellow and Editor-in-Chief of the publication of the China Institute for International Studies, um, uh, the China International Studies, that's the uh, name of their publication. Uh, the uh, Ms. Uh, Zhu Tsai Hua, Deputy Director and Professor, Institute of Foreign Trade, Chinese Academy of International Trade and Economic Cooperation, Ministry of Commerce, People's Republic of China, and Mr. Wang Yu Zhu, uh, Professor, National Institute of International Strategy, China Academy of Social Scientists, and Head of the Center for APEC and East Asian Cooperation, uh, and then uh, the Ms. Uh, Zhang Yu Wan, a Research Assistant at the uh, China Institute of International Studies. Let's give a brief background of the uh, institution, the China uh, International uh, Institute of International Studies is a think tank of the China's uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It was founded in 1956, the first think tank uh, under the uh, uh, present government, of course, under the name of the Institute of International Relations and assumed the present name in December 1986. In 1998, China Center for International Affairs, formerly a research institution of China's State Council, was incorporated into the CIIS with uh, Professor Chu Xing, uh, is the current president of the institute. CIIS conducts research and analysis which focuses primarily on medium and long-term policy issues of strategic importance, particularly those concerning international politics and the world economy. It also carries out researches on and offers policy recommendations on major international events and hotspot issues. CIIS has constructed a worldwide scholarly and second track, second track meaning uh, informal uh, uh, re uh, discussions uh, between governments, uh, exchange network, holding regular meetings with some foreign research institutions and running collaborative research projects with both domestic and foreign scholars on issues of shared interest. CIS currently has seven research departments, namely Department for International and Strategic Studies, Department for American Studies, Department for Asia-Pacific Security and Cooperation, Department for European Studies, Department for Developing Country Studies, Department for European Central Asian Studies, and Department for World Economy and Development. In addition, there are several research centers focusing respectively, respectively on the study of Sino-U.S. relations, arms control and international security, and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and many others. International Studies is a journal of CIIS. Its contributors include CIIS researchers and outside foreign affairs experts. Influential, the journal provides an influ, influential forum for the discussion of important international issues and China's policy. It has an English edition for foreign readers, which I hope we will soon get and also uh, bring to your, um, to your uh, attention and uh, uh, discussions uh, there to be brought here to our uh, program. And of course, uh, now we go to the visit. But before we go to the um, visit of the CIS uh, and uh, hosting of the uh, Philippine Council for Foreign Relations with under Joe Romero, Ambassador Joe Romero, uh, let me just say that uh, the Philippines has a dearth of think tanks. Yes. That is why our foreign policy is so mixed up. Mm. Well, in the past, it was assumed that the uh, American think tanks will think for <laughs> the, the Philippines, Philippine uh, think tanks, if there were any at that time. 
uh, from the nationalist Filipino uh, perspective, what do you think? Well, uh, we should uh, uh, abide with our constitutional provi provision regarding uh, an independent foreign policy. So, uh, the DFA must have a uh, tie up with our universities to put up a think tank. There and also with our Philippine yeah. BRICS Institute. Well, the Philippine BRICS Institute we established together. You are a director, I'm the founder, and we have several other members. We hope we can come out with our first publication in October of this year. Uh, of course, uh, we have other think tanks in the e economy, uh, Ebon Foundation, for example. Yeah. But there is really uh, a dearth. Mm -hmm. China is now the uh, second uh, is the second country with the second large is the country with the second largest community of think tanks. They have around six or seven hundred think tank groups. They invest yeah. their uh, money. Uh, the, the number one, you know, is the U.S. Yes. It has one thousand six hundred think tanks. But uh, those are funded by and run by private organizations. The private organizations oh. or the military industrial complex yes. or conservative groups mm -hmm. and so on. But there are a lot of think tanks to help shape national policy. Wow. And uh, uh, the, of course, in the Philippines also, we have the Philippine Council for Foreign Relations, uh, which I consider also a think tank. Yes. Indeed. And it has been uh, shifting from uh, the very conservative pro-American line uh, into a, a more independent uh, uh, perspective now. So we have uh, Mr. Ron Tsongze, uh, who uh, heads the delegation to Manila. He's uh, the executive vice president of the institute. And he had a very... Um, uh, important things to say in that discussion with the Philippine Council for Foreign Relations, as well as uh, Madam uh, Zhu Tsai Hua. Uh, and uh, this was a two and a half hour discussion, so mm -hmm. we cannot, uh, in this uh, 25 minute uh, segment of ours, but we will continue it uh, in the next week and the weeks after, including the uh, discussions with uh, Joe Romero directly. But we will include uh, a uh, an exposition by the ever, um, uh, shall we say, uh, verbose uh, uh, former Speaker of the House, Joe de Venecia, uh, in his discussion about joint exploration and joint exploitation of resources. Okay, we'll have first Mr. Ruan Zongze, but uh, first uh, a short segment of the three um, uh, members of the, the CIIS delegation introducing themselves. Certainly, I regard myself as a scholar because I spent most of my time in the Institute. Um, maybe very briefly, uh, I'll introduce my other uh, colleagues, or oh, I'll ask them to introduce themselves. Um, my final words, uh, actually, I just uh, talked to his uh, ambassador. Uh, he mentioned this group, a very distinguished group, for most of them are retired diplomats, a general, businessmen, and many others. So we finally we agree, diplomats never retired, general never retired, businessman never retired. So we're all just all together. So when, uh, yeah, we just change tire, but not to retired, never retired. So it's my great honor to be here, and I'm really looking forward to our discussing. Uh, I'll, I'll invite my colleagues. Professor Zhu to introduce herself. Thank you. And uh, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. Uh, my name is, as just uh, with the professor, I introduced Zhu, Zhu Caihua. Uh, I was a professor and the dean of the Department of International Economics. Uh, at uh, China's Foreign Affairs University. But now I'm working as, the, as a scholar uh, with the Chinese Academy of International Trade and Economic Cooperation affiliated to the Ministry of Commerce, uh, namely MOFCOM. <laughs> yeah, MOFCOM. And uh, I'm also very honored to be here, have a chance to exchange our views with each other. And thank you. Good afternoon. My, my name is uh, Wang Yuzhu. Uh, now I uh, worked uh, as a, a research scholar at, uh, in the uh, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Uh, maybe uh, some of you already know that CAS is uh, 
the number one think tank in the world in its number uh, research fellows. We have uh, more than 4,000 research fellows actually. Uh, we served our cen uh, central government as a think tank and uh, covered all areas of social sciences studies. So for our uh, international uh, department, uh, we have eight institutes uh, and uh, our institute, uh, international, uh, National Institute of International Strategy, uh, originally uh, doing study about uh, Asia Pacific regions. Now it's tried to extend it more to uh, cover uh, some strategic uh, issues. Uh, and this time uh, I'm very uh, honored to be here to uh, uh, you know, exchange, uh, exchange views with uh, uh, so many senior uh, you know, uh, fellows from uh, uh, Philippines. Actually, our institute worked very close with uh, PIDS uh, and also uh, some uh, top universities here. So we hope we can uh, you know, deepen our relations with our, uh, our you know, uh, 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 academic school uh, 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 group and uh, help to deepen our bilateral relations in the future. Thank you very much. So, uh, uh, Ferdi, uh, if you look at the amazing progress of China within 70 years from really the, uh, the ruins of 500 years of decay and China has managed to become number two in the world, uh, second only to the U.S. and some would say even ahead of the U.S. already economically. Uh, you can only attribute it to this uh, very intelligent, very well thought through uh, strategies of China from the time of Mao Zedong to Deng Xiaoping and now to President Xi Jinping. And uh, certainly all these think tanks, that's why they're called think tanks, mm. are uh, very vital in this process. The Philippines, we are just beginning to realize this. Yes, uh, because uh, all uh, policies, economic, uh, uh, diplomatic, must uh, be thought through uh, very carefully and uh, we must be deliberate about uh, all our actions and uh, that's what uh, China has done. That's why uh, it has achieved uh, tremendous uh, uh, successes in its uh, economic uh, affairs, in its uh, diplomatic uh, influence all over the world and uh, also in its uh, military might. Yeah. Uh, especially with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, right. of which the Philippines, I hope, will be part of. Because the Shanghai Cooperation Organization uh, is looking after the uh, interest, the yeah. strategic interest of the Asian, Asian uh, Pacific uh, uh, region, especially with the rise of uh, ISIS okay. and the suspected role of the United States yeah. in uh, the support for ISIS. Yeah. So uh, when we uh, read uh, about uh, pronouncements from China, such as during the time of uh, Deng Xiaoping, for modernization. Mm. Uh, and uh, for example, uh, the peaceful rise, China's peaceful mm. rise, and uh, good neighbor policy. Yeah. These, there are thousands of studies that go behind these yes. things. The uh, Obor. Uh, and then they, the one belt, one road, your, and then they summarize it to one phrase. Mm. Uh, so we must understand those phrases very well. Yes. Well, here is the next one, the peaceful rise and good neighbor policy as explained by uh, Mr. Ruan Zongze, uh, why does China have this peaceful rise and good neighbor policy? Uh, why, do, why are there some uh, incidents of conflict? Uh, well, that's part of the struggle towards achieving the good neighbor policy. You cannot just say, I surrender, or the others will surrender. You must talk and have dialogue. That yes. is one of the key strategies. So let's listen to Mr. Uh, Ruan Zongze, doctor. From, let me put it this way, from China's own experience in the past nearly four decades of opening up, one of the very valuable or crucial lesson or experience for China we learn from this period is that if you want to pursue the domestic reform to strengthen, develop your economy, you must have a benign, friendly, peaceful external relationship. So you must have a good relationship with your neighbor, so to speak. 
For China is the only country we have so many laborers, at least 20 laborers. China is a very lucky, but sometimes it's easier to love the human being than to love your labor. <laughs> Be honest. <laughs> but the, the point is, we have to exercise the patience and the restraint. So for when China opening up, one of the thing in China's foreign policy, we try very best and very hard to build a good friendly relationship with our neighboring countries, with uh, Russia, with, uh, with those Central Asia, even with India. Now, of course, India, we just have some problems. But basically, our relationship is uh, OK. And even with uh, with Japan and with others, so we try very hard to cultivate a, a benign external relationship. Because by doing this, you can very much concentrate on your domestic reform. For this reform and opening up, there are just the two sides of one coin. You can't just have opening up without the reform, you, or vice versa, you can't just have the reform without opening up. Reform for, for China, we want to try to integrate China's economy to the world economy. So we must do a lot of reform domestically. However, in order to do this, you need to greater openness. So this greater openness will reinforce your domestic reform, right? So these two, they are reinforced with each other and going hand in hand. So that's why Xi Jinping said, now the Chinese president just said, now we are going to dig into the second deep fundamental opening up and reform. Deng Xiaoping's opening up and reform is the first. Now Xi Jinping is engaging in the second round. Second round, the challenge is here. You know, in the past uh, several decades, uh, no hand fruit has been picked. Now what are you going to do is more challenging, more difficult. However, I think Chinese government is very much committed to do that. So from our own sake, our own interest, we like to have a good relationship with Philippines, with our friends, and with other ASEAN countries. This is not just a diplomatic note. It is China's own interest. And it's also the interest of the, of the region. Yeah. Then the South China Sea, maybe the final observation, I'll, I'll shut up and natural to it. Um, in the last couple of years, we must take a le learn a lesson also in dealing with the South China Sea. That means how to make sure that South China, China and the claimant countries that to, to address, agree to solve the disputes. Then in order to ensure the stability of South China Sea, China and ASEAN must work together. But there were some third factors, outside external powers. Recent years we have seen Americans, Japan, Australia, they, they didn't play a very positive role, be very honest. They're getting themselves involved not for help us to solve the problem, they're amplifying the problem. For example, America, I spent some years in the United States. I know something about their mindset, how they pursue their policy here. America has an ally system. So what is the ally for? If that don't have, if here is peaceful, tranquil, tranquility, and a stable, nothing happened, so there's no need to have the ally. In order to keep their ally aligned system, so that must create some tension to, in order to justify the rationale of their, to strengthening their allies. In the past few years, we have seen the uh, Americans pivot to Asia. It's really making this region more tension and troublesome. So in the future, in order to pursue this, no matter it's a 
a joint exploration or joint development, we should also keep against the keep a guard to fence off any kind of a third factors interference. Otherwise, it will make the things very complicated. And we should take the fate in our own hands, not on count on others. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, China and the Philippines, what we are doing is a kind, kind of pioneering job. And with the, with the joint effort, we'll make some very significant move to the direction which will benefit for our two peoples. Yes. Thank you. So our apologies for the waiters and the other people walking around. It was a very, very small room that we were in, and the sound system had some problems. So uh, now uh, we're, we have to cut short our uh, Philippine-China focus, and we will uh, show the Joe de Venetia responses next week. Uh, but we will end with the uh, uh, report by Ms. Uh, Zhu Tsaihua on the AIIB, which is very important to our uh, discussions here in the country. So uh, Ms. Zhu, let's listen to her and then we will just uh, end the uh, uh, show. We won't have time to say goodbye. Okay, go ahead. Uh, talking about AIB, I think first we must uh, admit that the AIB is an international development bank. It's not, uh, it's not actually a uh, China's bank. It's an international development bank. But why China proposed uh, the establishment of the AIB? I think this uh, proposal actually is a good thing, not only for the, the rest of the world, especially those developing countries who are in desperately need of infrastructure, but also it's a good thing for China uh, because uh, we know uh, the bank, uh, actually, uh, we have seen the bank have been operating for half and, uh, more than half and, uh, 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 one year and a half a year. And, uh, we, I remember, uh, in the beginning of the proposal, uh, the China, uh, the United States and, uh, Japan, they, they just show their uh, skepticism about the bank's uh, governance, and they give uh, China uh, an excuse why they uh, didn't want to join the bank. That is, we are worried about the, the bank's uh, governance. We are worried about the, uh, the, the transparency and accountability of the bank. Uh, actually, for China, I think it's a, a real t a test for China to show it's uh, uh, the bank's high standard of uh, governance, but this uh, half, one and a half year actually have shown or proved the bank's operation has been quite uh, successful because we have seen the projects financed by the bank actually are very, uh, you know, uh, very uh, commercially viable. And also the bank's operation is clean, green, and uh, 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 clean, green, and, uh, and uh, uh, lean. lean, yes, lean. Uh, actually, uh, uh, talking about the lean, we, we have seen actually a very successful model for co uh, operating an international development bank. Uh, the AIB is better, actually, in some regards, better than the, the World Bank, the ADB. For example, the AIB uh, doesn't uh, remain a residential board of directors. This actually have saved a lot of, you know, uh, 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 head uh, overheads. And also, it saved a lot of time for the, 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 the bankers to discuss the, the selection of the projects. And uh, also, uh, this bank has only a staff of uh, more than 500 or six, five to 600. 
actually come by contrast we know in the world bank they have uh, maintained a, a staff of more than 10,000 that's actually have saved a lot of uh, uh, overhead and to and make the, the the project more affordable for the developing uh, countries and also the bank uh, uh, adopted a very open uh, attitude in its governance. For example, when the 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 start of the when the bank uh, was just established, we have only fifty uh, uh, nine, 57. Uh, fifty seven founding members. But right now, we uh, the bank has already recruited more than eighty members, and the more members are also uh, applying for being the member of the AIB. This is very open, and still, I think, I believe, maybe by the end of the year, maybe about 100. <laughs> yes, and uh, also uh, talking about open uh, principle, I must uh, uh, mention that the the purchasing policy, pur purchasing policy of the bank adopted. Uh, we know in the World Bank and the ADB. It's uh, their purchasing policy has just been limited to the mem mem funding mem member countries, but uh, in the AIB, all the uh, purchasing purchase uh, uh, contract will be open to the world. That actually means the the projects financed by the AIB will have the lowest cost.